My name is Father Robert McGee, and I'm the chaplain here at the Newman Center. Many of you I know, many of you are here for a visit for the first time. Welcome, it's great to have you here at the Newman Center. We, in this apostles here at the Newman Center, are trying to serve about 6,000 Catholic students for our campus here at the University of Nebraska, with the chapel upstairs that seats about 300 students, uh, which has led us on this journey that began about five years ago on how to address that problem. And we began with an expansion idea, and now uh, we've moved forward to actually re rebuilding a new church, which we hope to begin this summer. So it's been a great process along the way. I have some wonderful people that have helped us on the projects. Um, I want to introduce you to a couple of them before our, our speaker actually begins tonight. Our two architects who are working on the project. Um, Kevin Clark, who's staying in the back. Um, Kevin, and he's here in Lincoln with Clark Collaborative. And James McCrary, where are you James? Right here, from Washington, D.C., who flew in this afternoon. And uh, we've been working together, Kevin's for about five years, and James came on the project about a year ago. And uh, we've had a lot of fun together, um, visiting here in Lincoln, and we've been out to see James in Washington. And, and um, actually, I got to James through our speaker tonight, through Dennis. Yesterday, one of the students asked me, he said, Father, how do you find these guys that kind of help you with this project? I'm like, uh, Yellow Pages. <laughs> 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 and actually, I first learned about Dennis through a friend of mine named Chris Carson, who I was in the seminary with, who studied for a while for here in the Diocese of Lincoln. He runs the uh, Diocesan Liturgy Office for the Diocese of La Crosse, Wisconsin, and is an adjunct professor at the same school where Dennis teaches, the Liturgical Institute at uh, Mundelein Seminary in Chicago. And so I called Dennis, actually, about a year ago, I think it was, before, the, and that's how I got connected to James. <laughs> and then revisited with him about a month ago to bring him on to help us think about the interior of our church and moving forward. And uh, he was gracious to agree to help us with that and wanted to begin the whole process by coming out here tonight, giving a lecture. And so we said, can we invite others? And he said, sure, the more the merrier. So we kind of put this invitation out to you and are really glad to be here tonight. And I think it's going to be very informative for all of us. So without further ado, please welcome Dennis McNamara. Thanks very much, Father. It's, it's my pleasure to be here. This is probably my sixth or seventh trip to Nebraska and to Lincoln. And uh, when I started my master's program at the University of Virginia, I grew up in New York, so I'm a complete East Coaster, never heard of those states out, those square states out this way. And um, I just stumbled across this state capitol that was sort of like a tall building with a sower on the top. I said, it looks like an interesting thing. It doesn't look like every other state capitol. I'm going to do my very first in-class presentation on the Nebraska state capitol. And I'd never been there. And then I talked one of my friends into going on a crazy three-day Virginia to Lincoln drive road trip <laughs> to see the great building here in Lincoln. And that was my first trip to Lincoln, Nebraska. And now I've been back a couple of times and, and very happy uh, to be here. My training is in architectural history. And uh, my particular connection with that is how sacramental theology and architecture work together. And part of the reason I had to answer this question is because I knew what I liked in architecture. And then I'd sit next to someone who liked the exact opposite thing, and they were just as sure as, as I was of the opposite thing that I liked. And we didn't have a way to talk, because if you just say, I like it, I don't like it, I like it, I don't like it. That's not a way to have a dialogue about substantive content, about the nature of a thing. You're talking about an emotional response to something. So I said, well, what's behind this? And you know, being an architectural historian who works with churches, it's like painting a bullet, uh, bullseye on your chest because everybody's got an opinion. And sometimes I'll go to a wedding and I'll sit next to somebody's aunt I never met before and you do the small talk. What do you do? Well, I'm an architectural historian who works with sacramental theology and I help people build churches. Churches! I hate my church. When I was a kid, it had statues in it and then they took the statues out. What's the matter with all these architects? And I asked the same question myself. <laughs> Sorry, architects. <laughs> But there are a lot of great architects in the world. But what I realized is people didn't know why they liked things. They just knew they liked things. And so I went on this journey of trying to discover what's the why behind the uh, sort of emotional response that people have. And it came to a whole bunch of things. It led me to scripture, led me to understanding the Temple of Solomon, it led me to looking at the uh, heavenly Jerusalem, the whole tradition of the uh, Greco-classical, um, the Greco-Roman classical world. 
and then combining all that with our Catholic understanding today. So I had to write a whole big book about this. We're going to try to summarize that book in you know, an hour or so today. But I want to start with a quiz, okay, so you feel free to participate. Raise your hand if you think this is A, a prison, <laughs> B, a parking garage, or C, a church. A. Oh, there's all these cynics in the room, they think it's a church. Well, it actually is a church. It's an evangelical Lutheran church built right after World War II in, in Germany. Okay, how about this? Is this a prison, parking garage, or church? Well, this is a church, and it was designed in 2003 and built and finished about two years ago. And so this bu building, which we think of as the modern building, is actually quite old. And this building, which we think of as the traditional building, is you know, younger than any of us in this room. And so we're in this funny period now where, where we've rediscovered the tradition. And your building project is in uh, part of this. It's not the only building project in the world, by the way, that's doing traditional architecture. I want you to know there's a thriving uh, field right now. And you're really uh, kind of at the leading edge of it, but um, not alone in doing it. And one of the things I uh, often say about architecture is that it can be read like a book can be read. And this building here, this picture of the Chicago Temple, which if you've been to Chicago, it's right in the middle of the loop, right in the business district. And it's a Methodist church. And there's a church in the bottom, and there's a little chapel up here in the top, and then there's a bunch of offices in between. And when they built it, there was a height limit in Chicago that you couldn't build any higher than these two dark buildings there. And they got permission from the city council to have this sort of Chart Cathedral Tower come crashing into the Chicago skyscraper, precisely because they were worried that the church steeples in the city were now looking small compared to the skyscrapers, which were, they called the Towers of Mammon, or where all the advertising executives were and all the businesses were. And they said, what does this say about our city that we love money more than the church? And so they saw the architecture of the cityscape as something that could be read, that tells you something. And so they really had to cram church tower on top of that. And there's a cross on top that they lit up at night that they thought could be a beacon for airplanes to get everybody into O'Hare safely. And uh, that didn't last uh, all that long. Okay, here's quiz number two. Please raise your hand if you agree. Jesus' victory on the cross overcame sin and death. Mm, we got 90% like agreement on that. <laughs> okay, so nobody sins and nobody dies anymore. All right, we got one person there. You know, you hear this at Mass, right? Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Well, you know, my grandmother died 10 years ago, and what, where was the victory of Christ for her? Well, this is a funny situation because we're in this in-between time. You don't have to raise your hand unless you really want to on this, but we are in an in-between time where the victory of Christ is won. It's not going to be undone. The victory of the cross is not going away, but we still feel the effects of sin. And if you've ever heard that term about the pilgrim church or the language of journey, we know that there's a place to go. It's the heavenly Jerusalem. We know that there's a victory of Christ to get us there, but we're still in the process. And that's where church architecture lies. And this is just establishing the fundamental theology of it. Uh, Pope Benedict uh, borrowed from St. Gregory the Great the notion of there being three great epochs in salvation history. The time of the shadow, so that's the Old Testament. The time of reality, which is the heavenly future. That's when you get to heaven and you have this fullness of the face, uh, seeing the face of God. And then in between, there's this time uh, called the image. And that's where we are right now. And so the, shadow is full of, uh, the time of shadow is full of typologies that prefigure Christ. Priests and prophets and kings and temples and victims and synagogues and all of that sort of thing. Uh, reality at the end of time will be where heaven and earth are united completely. If you've ever heard of the new heaven and the new earth in the book of Revelation, or the wedding feast of the Lamb, the wedding is between God and humanity. The two that were separated at the fall of Adam and Eve are going to come back together like a bride and groom on their wedding night and celebrate for the rest of eternity. But we're not quite there yet. We're in this in-between time where the victory is being applied, but it's not complete yet. And so what does this have to do with church architecture? Well, it does several things. It fulfills the Old Testament, all of God's great deeds in the plan of salvation. It's a sign of the church living in this place. That little CCC is the Catechism of the Catholic Church uh, that shows Christ to be present in this place. So architecture that shows that Christ is present looks different from architecture uh, that shows nobody's paying attention to Christ. Think about the difference between a, like a strip club and a church. You know, Christ is seriously present in one and much less so uh, in the other. And the architecture actually makes that noble. And then by being signs and symbols of heavenly realities. That's from Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is the Vatican II document on liturgy. 
that is a foretaste of the heavenly liturgy and a sacrament of heaven. And of course, for the architects, it helps if it has a bathroom and an elevator and parking lots and air conditioning and all those things. Now, the architects are very competent. They're going to get you all that stuff. What we want to do today is hang around in the high ether of high theology and then see how that all works together with your building. And it all happens in the history of the world. So let's go right now in two minutes or less. What's at the beginning? Well, it's a trick question. There's no beginning, right? Because God has no beginning. <laughs> but it's a community, right? The Father thinks of himself, imagines himself, and begets the Son, and then the love between them is the Holy Spirit. So it's a, it's a community. And the love uh, overflows into creation. And Adam and Eve are happy with uh, God in the garden, and all is in right order. And the Greek word there for order is cosmos. So if you think about the cosmos or the stars, that's the, the stars moving in the order that God gave them. And that's also the root from where we get the word cosmetics, by the way. So if anybody put cosmetics on your face this morning, you, uh, you, know, you, you wake up with bedhead and all those problems, and then you put order on your face, right? That's the cosmetic uh, thing right there. <laughs> But what's the opposite of, of cosmos? Chaos. And where did chaos come from? Sin, right, the fall. Right? Everything's in right order until Adam and Eve choose something other than God and the relationship with God becomes disordered. It's still there, it's still participating, but it's disordered and chaos enters the world. Nature falls as well, by the way, which means something if you have a big glass wall in the back of your church behind the altar and because people say the view looks nice, let's watch the deer walk by. Well, that's fallen nature. That's not the new earth of the, of the end of time. Uh, if you're, anybody here remember Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, that TV show, what was the best part of that show every time? The lion eating the neck of the gazelle, right? <laughs> you sit there, lions all day sleeping, and then for 30 seconds it goes and chases the gazelle. Well, that's the fall on display. And with the fact that we like it means we're fallen. Because if you look at the biblical image, what's happened at the end of time? The lion and the lamb are going to lay down with each other, right? And the wolf's going to eat straw, all that language. So nature has fallen. And so we're waiting for the time for the world to be restored. And then Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden. And then what happens is that God's plan of salvation. So you have these Old Testament revelations where God says to Jacob and Aaron and Moses, you know, here are the Ten Commandments. Stop killing each other. Stop coveting your neighbor's goods. Stop worshiping false gods. So this is the way to bring order back into the disordered world. Uh, there's actually uh, a, quite a few architectural descriptions down here. It says Temple of Solomon. The, some of the most boring things in the whole Bible are all those descriptions in the Book of Kings and Chronicles about make these, these curtains out of this fabric and wool and linen and clasps of gold and silver and bronze. And it's real tedious. But if you actually say God is giving very specific and articulate architectural directions on how to make a building where he should be worshipped. So there's a biblical foundation for church architecture that is um, beyond what most people think. And then you have the incarnation, right? God comes intimately, speaks to us with a mouth, and we hear, uh, hear him with our ears. And the restoration of the world involves the restoration of everything. So these little uh, lollipop trees down here, the way they're shown in icons as trees that are restored to their divine glory, the, the glory they had before the fall, and the glory even more so that they'll have at the end of time. And then you know all this stuff, right? Founds the church, Christ founds the church, he gives the means to share his body and blood. And then there's this kind of trick, you know, hey, here I'm, I'm Jesus, I've given you all this stuff, see ya, going back to the Father, now it's your problem. But I'll send the Holy Spirit to help you, and that's where architecture falls. Because the sacramental life of the church has this understanding that we know God through matter. The body of Christ doesn't come to us by sitting in a dark room alone wishing the body of Christ would come. It comes through bread and wine that are consecrated and transformed and transubstantiated. And so we have this heavenly future where God is all in all. We're united to God with the angels and the saints. There'll be no sin, no sorrow, no death, and the fall will be overcome. But we're not quite there yet. We're on this red X here. This is the you are here mark in the shopping mall of salvation history. And we're sort of in between. This green dotted line here is the liturgy. It's what Chesterton called the trysting place between God and man, where the two would come and kiss. And so you have all these heavenly things where God has completely re restored the world, we're united to God with angels and the saints, there's no sin, no sorrow, no death. That comes back to meet us. And then you see the priest acting in the person of Christ. Well, Christ is pleading for us at the right hand of the Father, but unless you're a mystic, typically you don't get carried off to see that. So how do you see it in the sort of ordinary form of the Christ uh, pleading at the hand of the Father? Well, you know, Father Mattia will be your ordinary form of Christ pleading at the right hand of the Father. Right? He's doing what Christ does in a way that we can see. 
And then the people in the pews are members of that body. Uh, flowers and incense, the sweet smell of prayers rising, flowers returning to the Garden of Eden. Scripture is the word of God. Liturgical music, what does the sound of angels and saints singing at the sound of God? What is that? I mean, at the throne of God, what does that sound like? And then liturgical art and architecture are to show us what heaven looks like. And that's the thing you can say, I like it or I don't like it. But if you don't like it, then you need to do a little spiritual direction, right? Because that's the, what the thing is. That's what architecture is. The basic gist is mourning and weeping in this valley of tears, Adam and Eve out of the garden. We want to be in a place where there is no mourning, no weeping, no tears. This is a mural in the Salt Lake City Cathedral painted in the 1920s. And it's showing heaven and earth uh, united. Here's God the Father holding up the cross. The Holy Spirit is there. This golden wall looks like the walls of Jerusalem because this is the heavenly Jerusalem. The stars in the sky are not just little pinholes of light like we see them at night, but they're like flowers that have burst forth in glory because they've been restored to the grandeur that they would have at the end of time. And then you see various saints. Here's Moses with the Ten Commandments. This is Eve down here. And then various people like that. So, you know, I, I used to say, since none of us in this room are mystics, none of us would ever see this unless you visit this church. Until one day at the end of a talk, a lady came up to me and said, I am a mystic. And I said, okay, does, does heaven look like the book of Revelation? She said, yes. So I was glad that I was not, <laughs> I was not, <laughs> not proven wrong by a mystic in the room. Not trying to make fun of mystics, but th that's the extraordinary form of seeing heaven, right? This is the ordinary form. And what is all this stuff? Pigments are basically... Dirt and rocks, right? Anybody remember the burnt sienna crayon from the Crayola box, 64? What is that? Sienna is a place, and outside of Sienna was dirt that they burned, and it made brown stuff, and they painted on the walls, and they painted on the walls, and it started to look like heaven. Or if you use crush up lapis lazuli, you get blue, and it starts to look like the starry skies over the heavenly Jerusalem. Well, what process is that? God who took the dust of the earth and made Adam, you know, Adam's name means dust, and so this imitation of God the Creator is very high theology of what artists in the liturgical setting do. And in case you think I'm making this up, here's Vatican II. There's Paul VI, and there's John XXIII, and I'll you know, put my head over there. See, I'm right in the line with them. And if you read this part of it, what does it say? Holy Mother Church has been the friend of the arts precisely because they can sacramentalize that which we can't participate in in the ordinary way. All things should be set apart uh, in divine worship, should be truly worthy, becoming, and beautiful signs and symbols of heavenly realities. If you want to remember one thing from uh, Sacrosanum Concilium about architecture, signs and symbols of heavenly realities. So that leads us to these two questions. What's a sign, what's a symbol, and what are heavenly realities? So here's a stop sign, right? It doesn't make you stop. A brick wall would make you stop if you drove into it, right? This is a thing that suggests you stop. So a sign, by definition, doesn't make active and real the thing it symbolizes. It's, it refers you to somewhere else. So when my uh, nephews and nieces, the, can you guess what the first word they learned in their life was, practically? McDonald's. Right? <laughs> they knew that golden arches, and they called it Old McDonald's at the beginning. And so you see the golden arches, what's nearby? Hamburgers, hamburgers right. Now that golden arch does not make the hamburger present. It suggests you go inside there and get a hamburger. Now a hamburger is a symbol of a hamburger, but a Golden arches is a sign of a hamburger. How about this uh, lamp on the right? Old-timey gas lamp. What kind of town do you think it's in? Boston, old, right? It has gas lamps that doesn't, doesn't light up very much, but they still pay the gas bill, right? So it's something they value. It's actually a town north of Chicago called Lake Forest, which is very, very fancy, uh, rich uh, suburb of uh, Chicago, and so they can afford old-timey lights that don't light up anything, but it's a sign of their civic values, right? But then look what's on that sign. That lamp is a sign, and on the sign is a sign. It says no parking between signs, so it's a sign about signs attached to a sign. <laughs> but that's how these things work. I mean, it's a whole network of things. You know, if I showed up in a Speedo here today, you would say, that's a sign that that guy's crazy, right? <laughs> And it would be. I came, you know, reasonably professorial, not too, not too formal, not too whatever. You know, that these are all the signs. Whatever you decided to dress yourself today, what kind of car you buy, what kind of house you have, whatever liturgical preferences you have, these are all signs about, uh, about you. Here's something very simple. This is a school associated with a parish. 
And you can see this is the coat of arms of the cardinal archbishop, and there's the real boss, right? The, the cross, the Christ right above there. Very clear sign about how the hierarchical arrangement of authority works. But if you look a little more closely at this picture, it looks like a boring brick wall, but you might notice every one, two, three, four, five rows of columns, uh, bricks, I mean, there are narrow ends of the bricks that come across this way. Those are called headers. And to put headers in a brick wall is to elevate the sophistication of the way the bricks are laid. And so you can have hierarchies within brick walls. Who knew, right? Ends, they could be very complicated, they can be glazed, they can be colored, they can be laid with patterns. So the front of a church will be different from the back of a church. And the way you lay the bricks can be a sign about what's more uh, important in the hierarchy of parts. Okay, which one of these buildings is uh, more important in the life of the place? This one or this one? I'm, I'm hearing the one in the back, that one there, yeah. How'd you know? It's tall, right? It's got a tower. It's got fancy brick. This doesn't have much uh, fancy stuff going on. This is the shop where you buy your coffee and newspapers to get on the train to go to Chicago. This is the city hall of Lake Forest. So since the city hall is about governing, it's about justice, it's about living rightly and justly, its architecture matches. And because it's something you need to do, you need to find, there's that tall tower. You can see it over the other buildings and find your way there. Okay, now what can you guess about heaven, whether you're a theologian or not? What can you guess by reason? Heaven, ordered or disordered? Ordered. You been there? Well, no, but that's what, the, that's what makes heaven heaven. Everything there has been restored to cosmos, right? All the cosmetic work has been completed. Centered on God or centered on something else? God, you got it. Empty or populated? Populated with who? Saints and who else? <laughs> Ex-sinners, right? That's what saints are. Angels, right? The Trinity itself is in a nice community uh, praising each other. And so when you think about a church as an image of heaven, heaven is populated by angels and saints. Therefore, a lot of churches have images of angels and saints in them. You see the difference between when I was a kid, that's what we did and don't tell me anything different. Or when I was a kid, a priest hit me with a stick in front of a statue of Mary and now I hate statues of Mary. Right? Sorry, priest, I know you don't hit people with sticks, but I talk to people all the time who got hit by nuns with sticks. <laughs> Anybody in the room been hit by a nun with a stick? Yeah, okay. Some people never get over it. They just never go back. There was an evangelical um, pastor I met. He said 50% of his, pa his uh, parish or congregation were ex-Catholics, and they hated statues. And the, it was the evangelical trying to put statues in their evangelical churches, and the ex-Catholics were the ones telling him not to do it. Now, that's a funny situation that they associate images with bad stuff. That's a, you know, a need for some you know, therapy or whatever. But that doesn't change the fact that a church is a sacrament of heaven and heaven is populated with heavenly beings. And it's radiant and it's perfected and so on. So art and architecture are supposed to show us all of this. Now the question is, how can art show us heavenly realities? Well, the Eastern Church, icons are called sacraments with a small s. Not seven sacraments like we think of, but small s sacraments. And John Paul II kind of echoed this in his letter to artists. The reason is, icons don't just show a portrait of the saint as they existed on earth. They show the saint as they exist now in heaven. So that they're perfected, they're free of the earthly passions, they radiate the life of Christ from within. It shows the fall undone in them. It shows the victory of Christ that we we're showing on that timeline completed and then pulled backward into our own time. They call this anticipated eschatology which is one of those fancy you know, theology department words for knowing now what life will be like at the end times when it's completely restored with God's glory. And it uses matter, wood, paint, gold, to make the something of the saint present. Not just that they're up there somewhere. It's not just the golden arches of McDonald's suggesting hamburgers are over there. It is actually mediating the reality of the saint into our very time and place. And it requires a stable iconography. Uh, Peter didn't walk around with keys when he was going out fishing all the time, right? He didn't have a perfect wavy beard and yellow and blue robes. But we need to see a guy with keys so that we know who St. Peter is. This uh, saint down here, St. Peter the Alut, he's a saint in the Ortho Russian Orthodox Church, not in the Western Church. He's one of those guys from the Aleutian Islands in um, Alaska. That's why he's shown with his heavy winter coat on. Not because it's cold in heaven, but because we need to know what uh, saint is being represented there. So let's look at some of this stuff about the Temple of Solomon. Anybody done any of those Jeff Cavins Bible studies or study? Yeah, you've read all those long descriptions from Kings and Chronicles about what the temple should look like. 
Or maybe you've heard of Second Temple Judaism. This was the, the second temple that Christ lived in the time of the second temple. Well, Solomon builds this temple, and then it gets destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed. And then Herod builds this great architectural ensemble. And if you go to Israel, and you go to the Israeli State Museum, there's this big, big outdoor model of the city of Jerusalem in the time of Christ. It's probably five or seven times the size of this room. It's just all big outdoor place. And there's the Temple Mount. And every time you hear about the apostles walking around in the temple or Christ teaching the teachers in the temple when he was a child, this is the kind of place they were in, a big, white, gleaming stone city on the top of a high hill. You can see, whoops, you can see all these uh, columns. Uh-oh. There we go. Okay, wrong button. You can see all these columns running around here. And then this building right around here, different gates that are mentioned in Scripture, the beautiful gate, Nicanor's gate, uh, right around there. And then a building right here. And if you see, oh, okay, I pressed the wrong button again, sorry. Okay, there we go. I know I pressed the right button that time, but it didn't do the right thing. Okay. If you could see that little building in the center cut open, you would see it would have three parts. A porch with a hollow, pair of hollow bronze columns, a big room inside here, and a little room in the back called the Holy of Holies, and there's the high priest standing next to a golden table with 12 round loaves of bread on it. They were called the bread of presence, and they were brought into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. So it sounds a, a bit like a, a type of our Eucharist. And you can see the plan with a porch, a big room, and a little room. And this big room here called the Hekal, if you read the biblical descriptions, it said it had palm trees and flowers and vegetables and angels, and it was all covered with gold. So you hear palm trees, flowers, vegetables, what do you think of right away? The garden, right? Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. How do you get humanity back in the garden? Well, they did it in this case with architecture to show it. And the language, the biblical language of the garden and the desert always comes up all the time. If you go to the Holy Land, you'll see there's some moist areas around the Sea of Galilee, and then you go down the hill to the Dead Sea, and it's the worst desert you've ever seen. And then you see this Sea of Galilee area with orange trees and waterfalls and so on. So this notion that architecture could show you what it was like, not only to be back in the Garden of Eden, but to be in the garden at the end of time that's glorified, and that's why it's covered with gold. And then this little square room in the back uh, had the Ark of the Covenant, Covenant in it, Maybe you remember the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie from the 80s and the golden box. And remember that when the guy's face melted off when they opened the top of the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant is this golden box that the Israelites carried around, and it was God's throne, God's presence, the glory of God, the Shekinah would sit on it. And when the Israelites had God with them, they'd defeat all their enemies, and when they didn't, they would lose. And so that's why the Nazis were looking for it in that uh, movie. But it's 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits in shape. So what shape does it make? 20 by 20 by 20. It's a cube, right? So remember that because that's going to come back. And in between the two rooms was the veil. And to pass through the veil was to step from the garden, which was the earth, into the place where God's throne was, which was heaven. And so earth and heaven separated by the veil. And to pass through the veil, we still use that sometimes for people dying, they pass through the veil to go from heaven to earth. And the veil was a big curtain made of four different kinds of fabric. Uh, there was linen, which was sort of earthy and brown, and then three colors of wool, blue, purple, and scarlet. And blue represented the air or the skies, the birds. Purple was the sea with the red blood of the fish uh, swimming in the blue water. And then scarlet was the fire. And so the logic was that this was all that separated heaven and earth was the veil. This is why in the letter to the Hebrews, what happens, uh, excuse me, in, in scripture when um, Christ's body, when he dies, what happens in the temple? The veil is torn, right? Because his sacrifice is complete. All that separated heaven and earth is now torn, so the grace of heaven can come rushing down to the earth. And that was represented very clearly in architecture. Sometimes you see at the Annunciation, the Virgin Mary is doing some kind of weaving or needlepoint or something. See this little red batch of wool she's working on? This is one of the, um, one of the, the lore, non-biblical stories from the Proto-Evangelion of James, that the Virgin Mary was a, a temple virgin, and her job was to weave new veils all the time, because they would get wet and covered in blood, and they had to make new ones. And so just as she wove, the Christ wove his body from her fabric of her body, she was weaving the veils for the temple just as she was weaving Christ in her own body. And so that's why you often see her doing that in uh, images of the Annunciation. 
And here's the Ark of the Covenant, or somebody's image of it, two angels on either side with God's presence in the middle. The Lord reigns in Psalm 99. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, and the cherubim are these two little angels here. Have you ever uh, found in your own life experience a golden box where God's presence dwells with an angel on either side of it? Yeah, this is the tabernacle, right. This is the tabernacle in many churches. It's the continuation or the, the fulfillment of the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And one last thing about the high priest. He wore all kinds of funny stuff, just like if your bishop comes to say, well, when you get a bishop, he'll come and say mass and he'll have a funny stuff on, including a tall hat like the high priest and his fabrics uh, made of, uh, of vestments made of different fabrics. One thing he probably won't be wearing, though, is the breastplate of judgment, which the high priest wore, and it had 12 stones on it that were gems named, and each one had engraved in it one of the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So you think about the way the temple worked. God's presence is holy and it confers holiness. Sort of like how heat is hot and confers warmth. You go into a warm room, you get warm. The way that was understood then was if you went into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, whatever you brought into there would become holy. So they brought blood in with the bulls and goats and so on. And he couldn't bring all the 12 tribes into this little room in the back of the temple. As you know, they're all married off with the northern tribes, and they wouldn't have fit in there anyway. So like sort of proto-sacramentally, vicariously, brought all of the 12 tribes of Israel into the presence of God by the mediation of these little stones. So think about living stones now. When you think of the New Testament, you are living stones. You are God's building. They knew what they were talking about. The stone represented people, and people were brought into the presence of God. And then you start thinking, what are buildings made of? And they get a certain sacramental uh, quality to them. So the basic notion about the temple, just to summarize all of this, is the inside of the temple was a mythical place outside of time and outside of the fallen earth, where the earthly and the eternal were one. And the priests, importantly, were the ones who mediated between the worlds of heaven and earth. So think about this the next time you see Father Mattia put on funny clothes and he walks through the, na the nave of your chapel. Is it right upstairs here? Yeah, well, near, well, near, it's right upstairs, okay. And then he walks into the sanctuary, steps from the center aisle from earth to heaven, pleads at the right hand of the Father, then there's bread and wine brought up, and then it comes back as the transformed blood uh, and body of Christ. It's this very, um, should be familiar, temple ritual, even if you didn't know it was temple ritual. And here's a little church, a little Gothic church, that has a porch, a big room, and a little room in the back. Porch, big room, little room in the back. It's the standard uh, traditional church plan. And, you know, I grew up in New York, and I went to New York City. My grandparents lived there. I went to St. Patrick's Cathedral a number of times, and, you yeah, know, pretty church. And then I got degrees in architectural history, and I could say all the stuff about the Gothic Revival and Richard Upjohn and, the, you know, the, uh, all these movements and all these facts, 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 facts. And then I started reading about the temple, and I said, a garden, a golden box. Uh, I read this author who said the inside of the temple, she called a, a jeweled garden where the angels live because they actually knew that they would put jewels sometimes in the walls of the temple. The people would donate them and the priests would insert them in the walls of the temple. And then I had heard that Gothic architecture was supposed to evoke uh, the trees with the trunk down here and the branches coming up over there. And I thought, walking around in the garden, I, I don't get it. And five minutes later, I went up to Central Park, and I saw the Great Alley of Elms, where they have to carefully you know, trim these to make them grow so they don't get all crooked, but they wind up crooked anyway. This is the fallen world. This is the eternal, glorified, sacramental, anticipated world of the heavenly garden. And once you get that type, you start seeing garden things. Oh, I did it again. You start seeing garden things everywhere. Here's the underside of the pulpit. Flowers, buds, leaves, flowers, buds, leaves. Here's the unremarkable plaque over the heating system. <laughs> leaves, not any old leaves. These are not leaves plucked off the plant on your windowsill in the kitchen, right? These are leaves fit into diamond patterns, given the restoration of geometric perfection. And then here's one of the little side altars, which you could reasonably call a jeweled garden where the angels live, right? You see these leaves and these buds and then the mosaic representing jewels and then there's a saint here and then Christ uh, slightly off the picture there. So think about architecture now, not just as this sort of neutral skin for liturgical action as they used to call it back in the 70s, but as a sacrament of the world united to heaven again, given to us in kind of a sneak preview and a foretaste. And so here you see a church like this that's just random 19th century church I picked out. And you can see the altar rail 
is what remains of the veil. Now, altar rails are very polemical. You know, everybody says they're a fence or they're not, or we need them or we don't. I had those arguments with people. If you think about it as what remains of the veil, it's the marker between the edge of heaven and earth that can be opened with these gates, just like the veil was torn. Then all of a sudden, this pre-Vatican II, post-Vatican II argument becomes a theological discussion. And there's the golden box, and there's the angels on either side in adoration. Okay, and then you know, just quickly, we've got this architecture in the time of image. In other words, it shows Christ living in this place. If you visit any important sort of Roman or um, European city, you know exactly that people live here and that's a church. It's very clear. There are Christians, or at least in these European cities, there were Christians at one time who thought it was important enough to build a building that showed they were uh, Christians and Christ was living in that place. I had a little fun with Photoshop here. And so here's a church. You can see it over the trees. There's the same church without its steeple. And I know there's a steeple planned for your church. And every time I do one of these things, there's always somebody who says, don't you know steeples cost a lot of money? They don't do anything. They get hit by lightning. Ice falls off of them. They have to get repointed all the time. Yes, 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 and yes. But what's the value of proclaiming Christ across the city? How can you put a dollar value on that? It doesn't mean you have to have it, but it's a nice thing to have if you can swing it. And so uh, it shows Christ present in this place. And then just something else. Um, anybody here a fan of Bear Grylls, Man vs. Wild, ever seen this? Okay, oh, somebody's really happy about it in the back there. Okay, <laughs> big smile. <laughs> Well, he's this British, uh, Navy, British Navy SEAL or whatever, whatever he is, and he jumps out of a plane in the wilderness and he has to survive, and usually he winds up getting naked in cold water and eating bugs, and that's sort of the pattern. <laughs> now, if I had to jump out of a plane and I had to build myself a shelter, I'd be pretty happy if I could do this, right? This is not bad. It shows you the basic logic of how buildings work, though. Vertical things hold up horizontal things, and sometimes they have diagonal things. There's a logic of structure. And then in between the structural members are these sort of grassy mats. That keeps the weather out. So there's enclosure and there's structure. So if you've ever put a tent together camping, you know you have those poles. The poles by themselves don't do much. Uh, you have to put the, the nylon over it to keep the weather out. But without the poles, the nylon wouldn't be very good either. So there's enclosure and structure. And if you get really good at this, you can maybe design yourself a cabin with really nice smoothed out poles and wrap it up in rope. And if I was feeling really creative, I could weave that rope into patterns and do something fancy with it. And so architecture starts with structure that gets elevated and clarified. And if you're really good, you can make your pole into this beautiful column with scrolls on the top and flutes carved down the side and a horizontal beam and another beam going that way. So there's a logic to structure. At the same time, it gets glorified and elevated by the addition of ornament. And a lot of this you see around older buildings. Uh, this is a little garage nearby where I live. It's a kind of a good old boy hangout on Saturday night. You drive by there and they're drinking beer and fixing their pickup trucks and that kind of thing. So there's, actually, there's a pickup truck in the picture uh, right there. It's a little local vernacular building. And the, the roof beams are sticking out the top. They're not really well done because you see they're not spaced evenly. But if you could do this a little better, you could have the beams come out in nice even ways. And then when you start to look at classical architecture, you'll see these little things called modillions that represent the ends of the beams. This one fell off in our tough Chicago winter, uh, but that's the logic. It's this beautiful way to show you how structure works. And you have the big elements, and then you can have small ones, little things like this that run across here. They're called dentals. And one of my favorite stories to tell, this is the one that all the sixth grade boys perk up their ears for because it has to do with blood and guts and dead animals and sacrifice. But if you see a well-developed Doric order, this is a Doric column. You may know columns come in a couple of different flavors. Uh, but this one has this funny thing on it here called a triglyph. Three bars, uh, molding going across here, and then little drop things hanging out there. And there was a professor at Yale named George Hersey who said, why do we make these things? We make buildings, and we put that thing on there, and we don't even know what it is. What is it? And he looked up the word triglyph, and he figured out tri means three, and a glyph means a line, like a hieroglyph. Or it also meant, in one of its other Greek meanings, a thing chopped, like a thing that has been chopped. So he's like, what has been chopped? And he looked at the Latin word, and the Latin word was femores. Any guesses what femores are? Femurs, yeah, thigh bones. He said the three-part chopped thigh bone stuck up on a building, what is that about? And he started reading the ancient ritual of sacrificing of animals, and he found that they would take the animal up the thing to the temple, and then they would tie its feet together so it couldn't run away. They would kill it, they'd disassemble it, and they'd put it back together, and then they would hang certain parts on the building. 
So the skull would go up because it had the brain in it, and they thought that was about the life-giving qualities of the animal being offered to the god. But the, the femur was so big, it had so much marrow in it, that they cut it into three parts, tied it together with a tendon, wrapped it in fat, and then put it up on the building. And it conveniently covered these ugly ends of beams that were sitting there. And so they put them over there. And so the triglyph is three pieces of thigh bone. This molding, the classical architects in the room will know, is called a tania to this day, which is the Greek word for tendon. And these little things called gute, that's the marrow dripping out of the bones. <laughs> it's kind of creepy, isn't it? <laughs> now, why would the early Christians start using this? They're worshiping Zeus? Well, think about it. Augustine, St. Augustine said, anything well said by the pagans should be kept. And architecture had developed a system by which the bloody bones were, re were reduced or uh, changed to architectural versions of them. This is no blood, this is stone carved or wood. And so it's an unbloody record of a sacrificial victim in the ritual context. Well, that sounds a lot like the mass, doesn't it? The unbloody making present again of the victim of Christ offered to the Father. So they said, okay, look at this, the Romans gave us a system of architecture that's about ritual sacrifice. And whereas the Greeks and the Romans would put sort of pagan images in between, sometimes you'll see Christians will put uh, patens or chalices in there, something that says this is the new sacrifice, so it's fulfilling the Old Testament. Now, who, whoever knew three blocks and some drops could be, have that much content? So architecture is legible once you know how to read it. It's sort of like looking at a page of Chinese characters and you've never learned to read Chinese. It just looks like a bunch of lines. All of a sudden, someone teaches you to read it and you can actually read and see what it says. And then you can take things like this. Uh, this guy here called the Vitruvian Man, maybe you recognize that. That was put on one of those space capsules that went out past Pluto or whatever in case they ran into any aliens. They could know that we have four arms and four legs. <laughs> But once they got over that, they would figure out, and you should tr try this at home next time you had a martini or two, measure yourself from fingertip to fingertip and from head to toe, and you'll see you're probably about the same and that you fit into the shape of a square. And then the circle, if you move your arms around and start at your belly button, you have this diameter that makes a circle. So the human body, created in the image of God, has the circle and the square as sort of geometric underpinnings. And so architects would say, well, this represents the mind of God somehow. You could pick any old rectangle if you wanted, but why not pick one that we know makes sense? Now uh, this, any, any Da Vinci Code readers? Uh, or you can't say it in front of everybody here, I know, but the, the golden proportion of the divine proportion was one of those things that they're all hunting for in the, in the Da Vinci Code. There's nothing weird about that. I mean, Dan Brown used it badly, but the notion that this is a, a proportion that exists in nature, it's like the fingerprints of God in creation, perfect. Why, why use something arbitrary when you can use something found in nature? And there's a theory about the, why um, this, the square is what we fit into. And there was a medieval mathematician named Theory of Chart who said that the sun wasn't really God plus one. It was God times God. It was God multiplying himself. So God times God equals God squared, right? So the Son was not the addition to the Father, but the square of the Father. And then when you get the Holy Spirit in there, it's God times God times God, which is God cubed. What was the shape of heaven in the Temple of Solomon? Cube, cube right. So it's the shape of God. That's the logic there. Architecture doing all this cool, cool stuff. And then we have human conventions too, like the Arch of Constantine. You know, Constantine's the first Christian emperor, more or less. And he had this great battle against um, Maxentius, and then he, um, he wins, he comes home, he tells them he won. They say, okay, go have a party, we have to make a big arch for you so you can come back in the city again as the victorious emperor. And so he uh, had this made with a little arch and a big arch and a little arch with columns in between. And that became the symbol of victorious entry into a city. Well, look at these entry doors, the chapel where I teach, little door, big door, little door the notion of victorious entry into a city. Not the emperor this time, but Christ. Not the rival for your um, emperorship, but Christ who's the victor over sin and death. And then we get to follow him right into this city, which is the heavenly city of Jerusalem. A door is a hole in the wall. A portal is a hole in the wall that's ornamented so that you know how important going in that hole in the wall is and it becomes a sacramental thing and not just a functional thing. And that's why doors in churches lo should look different from doors on McDonald's. And if you're having a really good day, 
you go into heaven and the whole assembly of angels and saints comes to greet you, right? But you still have the little door, big door, little door uh, notion here. And then something about columns. <clears throat> Anybody study columns? You heard Doric, Ionic, Corinthian before? Yeah, I've got a few. Well, they have this uh, traditional hierarchy, Tuscan, which is sort of a low-brow Doric. Doric, which is relatively simple here, there's that triglyph. Ionic has these scrolls of the uh, volutes. Cor compo excuse me, Corinthian has the leaves at the top, and then composite has the scrolls and the leaves. And they were understood to be under used in a hierarchy. So if you were important enough to get columns at all, but a very unimportant building, they might use Tuscan and then work their way up. Middle status building might use Ionic. Really important building might use Corinthian. Top of the heap would use composite. So here's your quiz. What kind of columns are on St. Peter's Basilica in Rome? Composite. I set you up for a trick question. I'm sorry. They're actually Corinthian. See these Corinthian columns here? Right? That's, a, that's the top of a person's body right there. They're really, really big, right? So they're important. But then the baldacchino over the altar, which is over the tomb of Peter, uses composite columns because it's the highest status spot within the highest status church in the world. And so just the column type that was used from altar to edge determined, made clear to the viewer what the hierarchy was. Those are hollow bronze columns, by the way, swirly hollow bronze columns. Remember that hollow bronze column from the front of the Temple of Solomon? That's no accident. First of all, bronze, hard to get all that bronze. They had all the cannon makers in Italy come to Rome to make these big bronze things. But what do they call David? They say, David, son of blank, have mercy on me. I mean, Jesus, son of. <laughs> Jesus, son of who? David. Who's David's son? Solomon, what does he do? Builds the temple. What does Christ do? He builds the new temple of the living stones. And so the Pope sees himself in the line of Solomon as building up the temple of the church, which is, which is us. So the material, hollow bronze column, suddenly layers and layers and layers of biblical symbolism come right through. And columns are also people, by the way. Biblical foundation for that, Galatians 2.9, Cephas and James and John are called pillars of the church. I imagine you are all pillars of the church, right? Who's an usher? Who does the bake sale? Who comes to the committees? That's you guys. You're holding up the enterprise of the church, just as columns hold up the building of the church. But this was not unknown to people in the Mediterranean region because columns were understood to represent people. Anybody know what the top of a column is called? Capital. Can you do some quick uh, word origin there? Head, right. You decapitated, right? Off with your head. So a column has a head, and it also has a pedestal. A pede, a pes, a foot, right? Pedal, pedestrian. So columns have a bottom and a top that are based on human body. The moldings actually are composed of, at the bottom, are also called a base sometimes. And the Greek word for that is basis, which means foot. So that sounds reasonable. But it's not just any old foot. It's the foot that's doing the ritual liturgical dance. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, 60-year-old women in leotards. I'm talking about <laughs> going up the hill to the temple, the swaying, the singing, so these are columns who are people who are doing liturgical dance. And so the Christians come along and they say, wow, here are columns that, look, here are columns that really look like people. Right? They have heads and, and uh, faces and bodies. Columns are people. People are pillars of the church. And then they come in hierarchies. So you can use columns in all kinds of ways. Uh, the story of this porch is called the Porch of the Maidens in the Acropolis in Athens. Uh, the mythical origin of this is that there were a bunch of Athenian city-states that were trying to get together to attack somebody, and they went up to the town of Carrier in Greece and asked them to be in their alliance. The Carrier people said no, so the Athenians forgot about their other enemy and conquered the Carrier people instead for saying no. They killed the men, because that's what they did back then, and they took the women and children into slavery. And to show to Athens that the, the women of Carrier were slaves of the Athenian state, they made them do the slave-like work of holding up that beam up there, which is... Not very nice. They, they're men columns. They're equal opportunity gender uh, exploiters here. But the basic knowledge, logic is <clears throat> columns are people. And then Vitruvius, the ancient writer on architecture, said, these women in Carrier were known for having these very distinctive kind of swirly cinnamon bun Princess Leia thing, hairdos on the side of their head. And they had to wear the widow's dress, which was a loose fitting garment. And he says the ionic column comes from the hairdo of the Carrier widows, who were presumably mothers, and then the flutes, these grooves in the column, came from the folds of their dress. So if you're an early Christian who believes God provided all this nifty architecture for you, how would a Christian use the motherly column in a church dedicated to 
Virgin Mary, right. This is the first church in the history of the world, Santa Maria Maggiore, to be uh, dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Also the first church in the history of the world to use big rows of ionic columns down the side. So you can start thinking about the way different columns represent different people and how they can be used in a church. And here's some people. This poor guy on the right, when I asked him to stand there for that picture, he never really knew I'd be showing this picture all over the place <laughs> for years. He looks pretty happy about it. But columns come in different shapes because people come in different shapes. And this is a Doric. It's kind of a barrel-chested Doric. And I guess that's the nicest way to put it. Um, and here's my crazy friend Gary from grad school who's about as wide as this column and his, his caput, his head, is about the height of that capital and his feet are about the height of that little um, thing at the bottom. So you have people uh, represented in, in columns. Now there are ways to use columns and there are ways to use columns that are not uh, so hot. Um, I, this one, for instance, shows what the standard column and all of its moldings look like. They've cut the middle out of this column. But if you think about the proportions of a person, you know, we say that man is six feet high. So he's about six times as high as his feet are wide. And so columns usually come in the proportions of people. So what do you say about these columns here? You know, they represent the lollipop league, I think. <laughs> this is an architect who wanted to build columns, didn't know how to make columns, just drew a column, and it didn't make any sense in relation to all the columns in the history of the world. So if columns are... <laughs> yeah. It's funny, but sad. They spent a lot of money on those columns. <laughs> if, if buildings can be read, that's a grammar mistake, right? That's a typo. <laughs> me come here, talk architecture, right? <laughs> You'd send me home, right? What do you know about art? You can't even put your words together. The same thing with this. If you can't put columns and beams together, you might as well um, not design things and waste <laughs> people's money. Happy to say you have really good architectural skill in your, architectural, um, in your architects here. Now this doesn't mean it has to be fancy. This is a very small rural uh, church in um, southern Indiana. And it has columns, or flat columns, called pilasters made of brick with little capitals. It's suggestion of the beam there and an arch that runs across. The arch lands on the beam. The beam is supported by columns. Perfectly legitimate, adequate classical architecture, but extremely simple, extremely simple. So you can do it on a little budget. You can do it on a big budget but you need to be able to know how to do it to do it well. And you're going to be building a Gothic church here of some kind. I just brought in a Gothic uh, cathedral looking up at the ceiling, and it works the same way. You have these ribs that support the roof, and they come down and land on these columns. And see how the columns are made of three little columns here? And each one has one column for each rib. There's this real super clear relationship of parts, structure to what's being supported. If you're a Thomist, if you like reading the Summa, where it's like chapter and heading and subheading, this is your architecture right here. One-to-one -one correspondences, subdivisions, and clarity all over the place. And then there's a lot of stuff on architecture. You see beads and eggs and angels and shields and masks and flowers. Uh, this one here, oh, wrong one. This one here is called the egg and dart molding. You can still buy this at Home Depot if you want. Uh, here's a really big one. Maybe it's easier to say there. And what that represents is the shell of the egg as if it's been cut open, and this thing inside is the yolk. It's showing you the yolk because that's the life inside the egg. So this is a sacrificial molding. It's related to the temple worship. Anybody really good with their Liturgy of the Hours? There's one thing made, the sparrows lay her young by your altars. If the sparrows came to the temple, that was a sign of blessing from God. And in the ancient world, it was the same way. If the birds came and nested in the temple and laid eggs, they would sometimes give eggs to the visitors and they would take them home as uh, souvenirs of the ritual sacrifice. And this, because you've always wanted to know this since you were a child, is why a rabbit brings chicken eggs on Easter. <laughs> because eggs are a sign of new life and a sign of blessing. And there it is. Now... What happened in that picture, or what's about to happen in that picture on the top left? Wedding. Wedding. How do you know? There's stuff there, right? <laughs> they hung stuff on stuff. And that's what we do when we're celebrating. If you put on a necklace, a jewelry, I see a nice scarf right here, a nice brooch right there. If you're in a festive mood, you hang stuff on stuff. If you have your roommate's birthday party, and he comes in, you yell surprise, and you say, oh, the cake's over there. And the room looks like it always looked. That's not much of a party. You hang those streamers up there with the happy birthday letters, and then you put candles on a cake and set them on fire and put it in front of the guy to blow out. 
That's weird, isn't that weird? But that's what we do. That's what festivity is. Candles mark festivity. You light up the night at a night game where you have the tiki torches on the back of your fraternity house when you have the party. So this is festivity. You hang stuff on stuff. And you waste stuff, too. These are rose petals. Those petals could have been doing something better than sitting on the ground, but they put them there because festive things require sacrifice. And these people went completely berserk right here. <laughs> I don't know who they are, but I got that off the internet. And they really didn't know they'd be in this, in this presentation. <laughs> but they took a nice honeydew melon and carved it in the shape of a swan. And no one's going to eat it, but, right? But it's a wedding. It's, it's a wedding feast of two people. Think about the wedding feast of the lamb. Right? What kind of enrichment does that require in your architecture? Uh, which one of these is from MarthaStewart.com, do you think? <laughs> if, if you talk without opening the back of your teeth, then that's the kind of ornament you like on your house, right? That's, that's it. But it's still stuff on stuff, hanging stuff on stuff. This is hanging a lot of stuff on stuff. And all the neighbors are coming to, to glory at it. But this is what we do. It's what we do. And so I was walking by a store somewhere and all this beaded trim that you can put on your clothes. We put stuff on ourselves, earrings, necklaces. Think of a bride on her wedding day wearing this white dress covered in little sparkly rhinestones or I don't know much about wedding dresses. Whatever you put on wedding dresses to make them sparkle. Necklace, earrings, carrying flowers. Maybe there's flowers in the hair. This is a person wearing the garden and wearing the jewels of the temple and wearing the jewels of heaven. She's in a white dress because she's the spotless bride that day. And who's down the other end of the aisle? The groom. And he didn't see her lately, but he's saying, come here, come down, come, come to me, come to me. And she says, I'm coming, I'm coming. And she walks really slow. And then the two become one in the sight of the church, the priest who's representing Christ. And then the two really become one, you know, not to get too raunchy here, but they become one on the wedding night, right? And then what flows from that new life? You see the microcosm of all of salvation history that happened in that 24-hour period? She's wearing the garden. She's wearing jewels. She's festive. And new life and the union of two becoming one. It's all right there. OK, uh, that's not supposed to be in there. Oh, yes, it is supposed to be in there. In case you uh, don't believe me, here is the line from the book of Revelation that is also the entrance antiphon for the feast of the dedication of the Basilica of St. John Lateran. St. John sees the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. So the church building, symbol of the church, the people, is adorned to meet Christ. And here's a column. Remember, this is the uh, Ionic column. It's the woman with her fancy hairdo, and she's wearing a veil in the scrolls of her hair. And she's got a necklace going right around there, and there's a flower right there. And so the capitals of columns are not just old-fashioned stuff that we don't do anymore, the, the corpses of a past age, as the modernist uh, architects like to call them, but they're potent markers of theological realities. And here's one of the columns where I teach. This is in the chapel. It's wearing a necklace right here. It's got beads in the hair here. It's got a cross as well. This one has flowers woven into the hair and then leaves across the top. And there's a quote from Psalm 144. May your daughters be graceful as columns adorned as for a palace. So not just any old columns, but columns for the palace of the king. And if you like your capitals to look like capitals that have never been done before, these are four capitals based on the four evangelists. These are on the entry to the YMCA in Jerusalem. Who knew? It was designed by the same guy who designed the Empire State Building, by the way. And maybe you can tell me where this came from. This is a salamander and a turtle and a lizard and a snake, and those are snails, and these are water lilies. Somebody knows. If you know, say it loud. It's the Lincoln Park Zoo, right? The reptile house at the Lincoln Park Zoo. And so they took the Corinthian column, which is as old as whenever it was invented in the Greek, uh, Greek time, but then made it something completely new that had never been done before in the history of the world. All right, and then we'll wind up with participating in heaven. We've gotten the Old Testament, our current day, and then the future, the signs and symbols of heavenly realities. What does heaven look like? Well, you have to go to the book of Revelation and find out. And here are a couple of important quotes. St. John goes off to the island of Patmos. He says there was a tear or a, a, an opening torn in heaven. That's a, a veil, temple of uh, language right there. And what did he see? A throne with one seated on the throne, and around that, a rainbow that looks like an emerald. Well, the rainbow from the time of Noah was the sign of reconciliation between God and humanity. Now it's turned into a gem, and there are these 24 elders dressed in white robes, and white robes are the, the clothing of heaven. Whenever an angel shows up in the Bible, it's usually dressed in white. 
If you ever put on an alb to be an altar server or to vest for mass, you're putting on the robe of heaven. And aside from these 24 elders, there were great multitudes from every nation, all the tribes, all the people, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So here's God. Here's the heaven centered on God. And then later, the angel talks to John, and they have a measuring rod to measure the city. And it's a pretty good deal. This is every architect's dream, right? What does heaven look like? Well, an angel showed me around, and we measured everything. And it's square in plan, and the length and the height and the width are equal, so heaven is a... Cube, right, there it is again. That cube is back in the shape of God. And then the walls are made of gold, the foundations adorned with every jewel. And there are 12 of them listed, jasper, sapphire, agate, emerald, onyx. I didn't put them all there. But how heaven is made of gems in the shape of God. Where the living stones, yeah, you know, I'm a hunk of limestone sitting on the side of the road. Well, what if I were a diamond? That would be a, a stone quite more developed. And people try to figure out which Apostle corresponds to which tribe of the heavenly, of the breastplate. There's every crazy theory on the internet you can find, but here's the deal. People are living stones. Stones transformed into gems are an analogy for being transformed by grace, where matter transformed by grace into something radiant. So the next time you go into a great old church, this is St. Mark's in Venice, every square inch of it covered in mosaic that looks like it's made of little tiny stones. And then here's the one on the throne, here are the four winged creatures, here's the, here are the white robed elders. And some people say, well, you're just a young fogey. Well, I'm not that young anymore, but I used to be called a young fogey. Now I'm a middle-aged fogey, I guess. What is this? Why don't you get with our day? Why don't you do what all the architecture schools are doing? Why don't you do what they're doing in New York? Here's the answer. This is from Paul F. Dokimov, who said, it's perfectly legitimate to search for new forms but they always express a symbolic content that remains the same because it has a heavenly origin. And that's the heavenly image of the heavenly Jerusalem. And modern builders have to listen to this angel of the temple. That's the one who gave the tour to John. So you look at an early Christian church like this, or a late uh, early Christian church like this, what do you see up there? Mosaics with the walls appearing to be covered in gems. Here are the white-robed elders with their crowns. Here's the, the lamb on the throne. Even the mosaics are even made to look like they're made of rubies and sapphires, and they actually put some mother of pearl inlay in there. Say, how, come, how can we make this look like it's made of jewels? Notice, no windows out to the beautiful vista in uh, Rome. If you want to see the earth, you're going to see the new earth in this church, which is this beautiful palm tree here, which comes right out of the uh, Temple of Solomon. And people still say that, right? If I win the lottery, I'm going to go sit under a palm tree and drink a Mai Tai you know, for the rest of my life. We associate palm trees with paradise. Now, if you really get good at this by the Middle Ages, you can replace almost all of the walls with stained glass of colors of sapphires, emeralds, rubies, and so on. And then they have little pictures of people in there. And so the living stones become like the light of Christ radiating through the gems. And there are uh, these columns here, these clustered columns. Can you guess how many there are? Twelve, right, for the twelve primary pillars of the church. And in case you didn't get it, they put a statue of each one on there. For the slow people, they get a little reminder. <laughs> but you don't have to do that. Columns are people. People are pillars of the church. And we saw these columns already. And I just wanted to show you a little bit of a tiny, tiny short introduction to Gothic architecture, because that's what you're doing here. Anybody heard of Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin before? Not a household name. But he was the sort of half-crazed Gothic revival architect in the middle, early to the middle of the 19th century, in the time of people like uh, Cardinal Newman and so on. And he thought that Gothic architecture was the true Christian architecture because it had nothing to do with those bulls and goats that the pagans were uh, sacrificing, like that classical architecture that I just spent a lot of time saying is really great. So he and I would go out for a beer and have a long talk, I think. But this is his favorite church. Uh, he built it, designed it, St. Giles Cheadle. And just to reinforce this sacramental notion, see how everything in this church is covered with gold, angels, leaves, gems. The walls are painted with these patterns that look like they're made of mother of pearl. Even the floor tiles are, are designed to have uh, the colors of gems and the leaves of the garden. This is a picture from one of his books. It's sort of his ideal dream world uh, where the funeral would have four solemn monks and perfect architecture and vestments and so on. But this is um, the, the 19th century romantic view of Gothic architecture. Other people saw it differently. This is from 1920s in Wheeling, West Virginia, of all places. 
The cathedral has the biblical vision right here. The one seated on the throne, surrounded by the emerald rainbow, the white-robed multitudes. This water coming down is the water of the river of the water of life. That's the image of the Holy Spirit who's bringing grace to the world. And then the starry skies above. And this is the floor of their sanctuary, which looks pretty fancy by our standards. But this was built during the Depression, and they didn't have a lot of money. So they told the marble guy, we can't afford big sheets of marble. Go use all your leftover pieces and make us a floor. And so he did, but look what it looks like. It's the streets of heaven made of gold and gems. What, would, what is the essential dignity of walking up the central aisle of a church or, or a baptism? I mean, how are you going to be reconciled with God unless you're baptized? And so what's the essential dignity of, bapt of baptism and therefore how does a baptistry show that essential dignity? This is the way to think uh, sacramentally about architecture. Somebody else's view into the image of heaven. Notice the palm trees are all along the sides and the bottom. The river of the water of life is flowing from the cross and down at the bottom there's fish swimming in it and birds drinking from it. It's a, and the new earth and the new heaven come together. Uh, now some people say, do we, need mold? do we need paintings? Do we need stained glass? I know they're trying to think through that right now in this project. Well, here they use both, right? Big stained glass window looking like a collection of gems and then paintings of angel choirs all the way around it. And you might be a person who likes neat orderly rows of saints. Here they are, pillars of the church, living stones all piled up. Or you might like something that looks a little modern but has Old Testament typologies listed all the way up from top to bottom. So here you have the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God coming into Jerusalem. Here's uh, Solomon building the temple, and you can see the bottom of the nativity there where the presence of God comes to the world. So they have the Old Testament working its way up, completed at the top. Or maybe you're tired of sweet-looking Victorian angels floating around, and you want to make your wall look like gems. This is from 1960. It's a church in Chicago where the walls were made of these square pieces of stone. But maybe you can see every now and then there's sort of a bright spot. Those are faceted cut uh, like diamond cut pieces of glass so when you move your head side to side these little flashes of light come out at you and so it takes on this kind of lively appearance. Historically never been anything done like that before but it's still theologically as rich as anything else. Maybe you like your old Victorian altars with lots of uh, statues of saints all the way up or maybe you like the idea of your uh, altar being covered by a canopy it's very much in the Gothic tradition or maybe you like something like this. This is a relatively new church built in Texas for a group of Anglicans that became uh, Catholic. And so they, there are people in the world who can make things like this. They're still uh, out there. Or maybe you like something really modern. But look what all these angels are doing. These are black slabs of marble that are incised and cut and then filled with gold leaf. And these are gold mosaic panels. And see the angels saying sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. The language of the mass, holy, 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 is as modern as you could imagine, really, from 1960 or so, but deeply, deeply theological. But what it can't tolerate is something like this. I'm going to throw this to you for a second. This was an award-winning altar from a magazine a few years ago. And, uh, okay, so I show up, I'm wearing a beret, and, you know, I'm all snooty, and I say, you're the building committee, this just won a prize, I'll do this in your parish. Now, this is stone cut to look like it's broken and unfinished because we're the members of the mystical body of Christ and we still sin and fall and we're unfinished and so it has to look like us and there it is. You buy this or not? You hire this architect or not? No, how come? The altar is Christ. The altar is Christ and Christ is not unfinished and broken, right? And this is the table of the wedding feast of the Lamb. This is the place of the offering of Christ to the Father. This is the anticipation of heaven. We know how broken we are. I mean, all you have to do is go outside and see it. You come to church so that you swim in the sea of perfection so that you become perfect yourself. You hear the sounds of the angels and saints singing at the throne of God so that your ears know what heaven sounds like. You see what heaven looks like. So you, get, you knock on the door of heaven and St. Peter says, you ready for this place? Yeah, I've been doing it for the last 80 years. I've been saying sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. I've been receiving the Eucharist. I've been looking at heaven. I've been listening to heaven, sacramentally mediated by really good architects and really good musicians and, and uh, matter and form and holy priests and all that stuff, right? That's how you prepare. We tend to think you're either in or out. You did something bad, you're in. Out. So, well, you did something bad, you're out. Something good, you're in. Well, there's something to that. But think of it like a gradual process. If you want to be a marathon runner, you don't sit in your room and eat ice cream and say, I wish I was a marathon runner, I wish I was a marathon runner, right? You go out and you run a half mile and it hurts. And you run the next day and it still hurts. And in a week you can run a half mile and it doesn't hurt. And you keep doing that until in your body and mind you are a marathon runner. 
think of that in terms of the, the liturgy and the architecture, you become ready to go to heaven. So here's this church. We'll finish up with one uh, case study here. Here's this church that um, you saw at the beginning. The um, parish had a budget of about $14 million for the church. It's a big church, it's 1,200. And um, the architect went crazy and he came up with a $20 million design. So they said, back to the drawing boards, and he came up with this to meet their budget, which is still pretty nice. If you hadn't seen the other one, this probably would look pretty nice. Uh, this is in Kansas, and the pastor wanted the people of Kansas to know they were Roman Catholics. And so they said, make us something that looks like Kansas and looks like Rome at the same time. <laughs> so they used this kind of clay that's there in Kansas to make it out of brick, but then it has all this sort of Roman-looking temple, a, a church facade on it. And there's the view from the side. This is the baptistry right here, which is uh, almost like a detached building, but it's actually attached right there in the corner. Uh, so it's got the tradition of the eight-sided baptistry. In the eighth day, the number A is the day of eternity, and baptism is the entry into the eighth day of eternity. Just to give you an idea, this little thing, this little golden top sort of uh, cupola up here with the windows, that thing alone was going to cost $150,000 because they couldn't get the steel to all meet in the center and they had to do something complicated. So they took that off. Nobody misses it and they saved $150,000 which they put on nice other things. And one of the things we decided, I, I worked with them very closely on this project, one thing we decided from the beginning was it needed an eschatological orientation. That liturgy is fundamentally about awaiting the second coming of Christ and that you're participating with the citizens of heaven. So the architects designed from the very beginning a place for a big mural to go. And this isn't exactly how it turned out in the end, but they were prepared for it from the beginning. And then the um, church furnishings uh, painting company, Evergreen, just made a little uh, sketch. And this is how it turned out. It's 24 feet high, so it's pretty big. And it's the one seated on the throne, and the throne is covered in gold and gems, surrounded by this radiance that's like the rainbow. They decided on the all-seeing eye as the image of God the Father, which... Everybody thinks it's a Masonic plot right there in their church, but it's not. It was actually a Catholic idea before the Masons uh, stole it. <laughs> and on the bottom half, a bunch of saints, saints of the Americas. So they had the kids from the school write reports about all the saints, and they had votes which saints should be in the painting. You see Miguel Pro here, and John Neumann, and uh, Mother... Um, Drexel, yes, and Mother Cabrini over here, and then the Jesuit martyrs, and here's uh, Junipero Serra, who's holding a little model of the church in his hands right there. And then buildings in the background, they're generic, heavenly Jerusalem buildings. And then there's this one funny one right here. Looks like an Art Deco skyscraper. And it is an Art Deco skyscraper. Anybody recognize this from the Kansas City skyline? It looks like the Kansas City Power and Light building, which is the utility company. But it makes perfect sense in heaven, right? The power and light building, there it is. <laughs> and I wanted them to do that because I didn't want them to think heaven was some platonic, far away, perfect place that's not where we'll be someday. So take a building that they know and show it glorified so that that's going to be the real earth restored at the end of time. And then the river of the water of life is coming in. Take a no, uh, notice of this little uh, pattern in the streets of heaven here, this di diamond pattern, the round pattern. And then look at the center aisle coming down the church. Because the church is this little extension of the heavenly reality. So you're walking down the streets of heaven on this tile, which is porcelain tile, not that expensive. And then when you see it in the mural, it's the same streets of heaven. Again, to reinforce this notion that that's a real place that's coming forward into our own time. And that's how it all uh, turned out. So you have the altar. There's a second altar in the back with the tabernacle. It looks like a tiny tabernacle, but it's actually in the back. And then the altar is right here. Notice there are Corinthian columns here, and there are Doric columns in the uh, front, and there are Ionic columns in the middle. So you have this progression up the column types. And then on the altar itself are composite columns with a sword in it, because this is the Church of St. Michael. St. Michael with the sword, there's never been in the history of the world a composite column at the top of the hierarchy with a sword in it. So this is the first, the St. Michael composite. It's never been done before, and here it is, as old as the hills and as new as 2009. And then there was text that went around the inside. This is one of the great canticles from the book of Revelation. Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will dwell with him. The only thing the pastor wasn't sure about is when you get to the end, it says, come without payment, drink milk and honey. <laughs> so... That's not what you want to have in your capital campaign. <laughs> but 
that painting showed you God dwelling with humanity, and now these words in gold leaf tell you to your eyes. So the building speaks in the way that buildings can. And then this little baptistry that I showed you on the outside has this mural over the top with the starry skies above and then the baptistry down there. So, you know, that big mural that I showed you had a lot of figures, 24 feet high. It cost $68,000. Right? $68,000 is a lot of money. It's not really that much money in a $15 million project. And that was the most important visual focus of the breaking in of eternity into liturgical time. And it was a fraction of a fraction of the total budget of the place. You know, how many bar parking spots is that? The architects can tell me what it's about, 20, 20 parking spots, something like that. Uh, and yet it was really, really important. One last building, since you're building a Gothic church here. I had nothing to do with this, but I've seen it. It's made the, some of the news. A big Gothic church down in Texas for an Episcopal church it uses steel, all the modernity that you'd expect it to have. And then on the inside, they finished it in various ways with Gothic arches, very gray. It's a little gray for my taste, but there, this wooden uh, screen was put up here, and then the baptistry has a, a marble around it to speak of the dignity of baptism. And these are all brand new windows. They made huge numbers of windows. They had 22 craftspeople working on these for years, over 22 months, 133,000 pieces of glass. And uh, it cost over three and a half million dollars just for the windows, but they made 36 of them and they were huge. But just so you know, the, the artisanship is out there. You can get it if you uh, want. This is another liturgical painter named Davis Dambly who uh, works now. I know they're proposing a little Mary uh, side chapel in the, in the proposal. Think of what a beautiful little um, sort of triptych like this could be placed in there. It would be this beautiful focus. There are people out there who can do things like these candlesticks and music stands and, and book stands. Uh, it's all available. So to wind up all this, I hope, I hope what you get from this, I know this is like throwing you in the deep end of the pool. It's just like, see what, however you can splash around. It, you might not remember all of this, but the big question here is, architecture is a legible, sacramental thing. It combined with its art, it tells you and allows you to participate in your own glorious future. So a picture like this shows a pile of bricks. You know, the dump truck came and dumped them there, and they're full of chaos, right? Full of disorder, and then these guys, come along, and one by one, they put them in the right place. So they restore them to order. And there's a beautiful hymn from the right of the dedication of a church, and it says, uh, you know, the beautiful Jerusalem, uh, shaped by the Savior Mason's hammer and put in the right place. And that's us, the living stones. You know, you're born with all kinds of problems, things you like, things you hate, bad temper, all that stuff. Little by little, whether it's your husband who tells you to be quiet or your wife who gives you the silent treatment, you learn how to get those rough edges uh, chopped off of you, right? And you meet people all through your life, the grace, the sacraments, penance, and you start to get shaped by the Savior Mason's hammer and put in the right place in the uh, heavenly Jerusalem, the temple of living stones. And that's what a church is. Now, I'll just finish with this one. This is a church from 1960 that shows the, the apostles lined up. This is the top of the altar right here. Maybe you can see there are angels on this screen as well, and then those jeweled walls of the heavenly Jerusalem behind, and the choir is behind the screen, so that the sound of the choir comes through where the angels and saints are standing as if they're singing those glorious sounds, and then it flows over the altar and down to the pews, and then when you look toward where that sound is coming from, you see golden figures and these gem-like walls. This is a really deeply theological uh, building. That's the idea here, that every decision you make should be made on these biblical principles, sacramental theological principles, and then when you say, my, does my church look like a church? You can say, yes, because it's the embodiment of all this beauty that we get to delight in. God's a pretty good God. You know, he could say, you're fallen, I'm going to punish you until you're done. He says, no, I want you to become like me by enjoying me, by enjoying heaven, by enjoying glory, by enjoying beauty, by enjoying delight, and that's how you will learn to be heavenly. That's the beautiful and wonderful loving God that we have, and that's how architecture participates in it. So I give you all passing grades on your quizzes. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Yeah. Is there a, I noticed in some of these different pictures, you had pictures of you know the human beings who are the pillars and then there's also the angels. Um, can you speak a little bit more about, is there a hierarchy to whether you use angels or whether you use humans or how those mix? Because obviously they're different things. Right, angels and humans have uh, different ontologies, you know, different natures, different being, um, nature of being. How that works, I've seen angels actually where the ribs of uh, a ceiling will come down in the Gothic church and instead of a column it'll have an angel holding it up there. They do the mystical work of supporting, you know, the, the singing of the, of the liturgy and then praising God. So they could be used in different ways. Typically though, angels are not represented in the form of columns. That's specifically an anthropomorphic shape rather than an, an angel shape. But they can be used in different, in, in similar ways. But um, Probably the closer you get to the sanctuary, the more they'll be uh, angels. Although they work in, in both ways, so I think you're pretty safe interchanging, inter interchanging them. Uh, yep. When uh, modernity, when it rejected objective truth, did they kind of, I don't know, unwittingly or maybe even wittingly reject beauty? Yeah, the question is when modernity rejected beauty. truth, did they reject beauty? Well, uh, if you're a good Thomist, you know that beauty definition of beauty is the full, clear, radiant manifestation of the ontological reality of a thing. So the nature of the thing as God understands it. That's what beauty is. And the reason we like beautiful things is because we're seeing things as we will see them when we're relieved from the effects of the fall. Because it's the fall that keeps us from understanding we don't understand as we should. If you see things as God sees them or somewhat closer to them, you delight in being spared the effects of the fall in your mind. And that's what we're all looking for. Now, if you give up the notion of there being truth, well, then how can you manifest truth if, you're, if you don't believe there is such a thing? And then, you know, the history of how modernity came to be, it's really a whole long philosophical set of ideas that started to, dis, to sort of go away from the Catholic sacramental thinking, particularly coming out of the Reformation tradition. If you know, you know, sort of people are hardcore about their Lutheran theology, believe that humanity and all of nature didn't just fall at the fall, but it was completely corrupted. We say we're fallen, but still good in the Catholic tradition. So we say material can be a bearer of divinity. Uh, and it can show us what God is like, as Christ's body did. And so if you say matter is not good, then you're not going to make things that look beautiful because you'll be attracted to an earthly thing that looks beautiful and then therefore become an idol. This is the, the basis of a lot of um, theological logic against sacred images. And growing from that was this notion you can't trust matter. And what kind of building can you have with the absolute least amount of material? A bunch of steel I-beams and clear glass panels on the outside. Right? No stone, no carving, no ornament. You don't trust matter. You want to use as little of it as possible. And, and there, it can get even worse. Anybody heard of Frank Gehry, the architect? He designed the Bilbao Museum and the big Disney concert hall. Basically, these buildings look like crumbled up pieces of aluminum foil thrown in a corner and turned into a building. And that's, that's what they do. Let's crumble up a thing, get somebody to make a building out of it. If you read his theology, well, he doesn't have a theology. It's a theology. He doesn't know it's a theology. But he says, well, chaos entered the world. We've been trying to get rid of it forever. We make these grids over the cities. We build classical <coughs> buildings. And we still rape, murder, pillage, and do all these bad things. All we know is that we don't really know what we're about. We know we're bound to chaos. So I'm going to take a building, crumble it up, and throw it in the corner. And there's the built form of chaos. Well, that's about as anti-incarnational a thought as you can think, right? Because we're all about participating in overcoming chaos. And he was one of the finalists, by the way, for the Vatican's Church of 2000, <laughs> you know, 12 years ago. A guy whose core philosophy was about as opposite to Catholic philosophy as you could imagine. But people don't think about architecture philosophically. And so once you start figuring that out, then things uh, start to make a little more sense.